Wow, what more could you want? Love that. Well, today's a day I've been waiting on for quite a while. When Randy and Karen Sears came here, and uh, most of you know, she is an ordained elder in the Nazarene Church, and I said, I'm going to plug you in from time to time to preach for us. And uh, we set a day of March 13th. And anybody remember what happened on March 13th? It snowed and church was canceled. <laughs> and then there was another date and then uh, her, uh, her dad died and there was a funeral. And I said, no, I'm not going to ask you. Uh, your heart's broke right now. But here we are. I've been waiting forever, it seems like, for this moment. <laughs> but... Um, You've heard Karen before because she filled in when I was gone. This is my first time to get to here, but uh, I've looked forward to this. But Karen, would you come and uh, would you share the Word of God with us this morning? God bless you. I put this up here earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a privilege. It is a privilege. I, I always look at it that way. And... Um, I'm glad to get to be here today and preach for all of you and to share the Word of God with you. Um, I, I want to tell you this. This is just something. I carry my Bible with me um, always to the pulpit. But unfortunately, in these days, I have to print out the Scripture <laughs> so from the pulpit. It's big <laughs> enough that I can actually read it when I have to preach. So my word is with me in case I need it to look something else up in the middle of the sermon or I just want it here. But I encourage you this morning to open your Bible or your phone or your tablet or whatever and turn to um, Numbers, um, the 21st chapter of Numbers, fourth book of the Bible, to um, verses 4 through 9. And before I begin, I'll, I'll be reading that in a few minutes, but before I do, I'm going to stop for a minute and uh, let's close our eyes for just a moment. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, Fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. God, I believe that you will answer our cry this morning. I sense your presence here among us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Well, in the third chapter of John, there is a verse that exists. It is the most known verse in the Bible. It's the most loved and it's the most foundational in our Christianity. Know which verse that is? 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. This came about one night when Jesus had a visitor. A religious man by the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, had come to speak to him in the night and wanted to have a conversation with Jesus about the things that he'd been talking about in public. In this conversation, Jesus shares this verse with him, and we know it so well. We're so familiar with it. Even people who don't know the Lord know that verse. But what we're not so familiar with are the two verses that precede it. The two verses that proceed in 14 and 15 say, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Snakes in the wilderness. A snake lifted up in the wilderness. These are strange words, 
But you know what? Nicodemus would have understood as a teacher of the law what Jesus was talking about. This amazing story behind snakes. It's in the middle of the fourth book of the Bible, which I said. It's actually the fourth book of the Torah or the law. I'm sure that Numbers, though, is one of those books that, you know, you get up once or twice a week and go, I think I'm going to have my devotionals in the book of Numbers, right? <laughs> How many of us really do read the book of Numbers very often? But there are some amazing stories in the book of Numbers. And I would encourage you to spend a little time there. This is one of those. Now, this story is about snakes. It's about snakes and it's about the children of Israel, they have left the promised land. I mean, they've left Egypt and they're on the way to the promised land. And it does have some strange things in it about snakes. I want to tell you, how many of you living in the North Georgia mountains have a snake story? <laughs> Don't we all have snake stories? Randy and I have a snake story. I have to tell you our snake story. Actually, it's kind of my snake story because Randy doesn't like this snake story. <laughs> We were living in our, our first home in Blue Ridge, and um, we'd had some wood dropped off that had been cut, and there was a big pile of it. And it had been some weeks since it's been there, and he'd not had a chance to stack it and put it under the porch. And I was in the house, and I heard all this screaming and yelling, and I'm thinking, something terrible has happened to him out there. And I went running out, and he's standing there near the pile, hollering for me, and he's got a, a hoe or a rake or something, and he says to me, there's a huge copperhead in that pile. He said, go around to the other side, and when it comes out, stop it. <laughs> okay, there's two things wrong with that statement. First, I have no weapon. Second of all, if it comes my way, guess what? I'm going to the opposite. He did have a chance to subdue it and take care of that copperhead, which was one less copperhead in the world, which is one, something I'm happy about. <laughs> but this, this is a story about snakes. But more than that, it is this amazing story about God and sometimes his hard ways to understand, sometimes weird ways of saving his children that at first sight we don't really quite get it. This story, well, I'm going to read it to you now. Let me read it. From Mount Hor, they set out on their way to the Red Sea and to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on their way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among them, and the people, and they bit the people, that many of the Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you, to pray, and pray the Lord take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon the pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Now some, some passages and some translations use the word serpent and some use snakes. I'm just going to call them snakes because that's what I think of them instead of serpents. But... This is an account near the end of the wilderness journey. The children of Israel have been wandering around in the desert for almost 40 years. And they are there on their way in this long journey to the promised land. And at this point in their journey, they have to make a detour. They had hoped that they would actually be able to go through Edom, but they were denied access by those who possess the land. So this forces them to have to go all the way around Edom, the opposite direction in a very long, very hot, very dry journey. They were not happy campers. And they became impatient. And if you read the records of the Israelites very much, 
and their wilderness journeys for those 40 years, you quickly realize that impatience was a common occurrence, with a very common theme for them. Complaining, grumbling, and what I'll just call whining. At times, in the book of Numbers, they use the identical words to complain to Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and there is no water and we detest this miserable food. It would almost be funny if it wasn't so serious, wouldn't it? And their exaggeration about the food and the water. They say they have no water, I mean no food, and in the same breath, they say we detest this miserable food. Which is it? <laughs> now it's true that there were not always natural sources of food and water for them. But God was continually and miraculously providing for them, wasn't he? Yeah. When we think back and we recall this journey with the children of Israel, God had chosen them. He had miraculously delivered them from Egypt, from slavery, 400 years of slavery. He had given them commandments as instructions for living a faithful life as a free people, no longer in slavery. And he had coveted with them that they would be a redeemed people. In the wilderness, he went before them day and night. And his presence was with them symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant. And even more than that, he had graciously provided for them bread from heaven, manna. Remember that for six days of the week, the manna was provided for them. All they had to do was go out and collect it. And on the sixth day, they collected extra so that on the Sabbath, they did not have to collect the food. God had graciously given them everything that they needed. But it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. They complained, as they had in the past. But this time, y'all, we have to look at this very intently because there's something different about it. There's something very specific that we need to see. This time, the scripture tells us in verse 5, the people spoke against God and against Moses. This is the first time that the people had ever complained in the 40 years of this journey against God. It had always been Moses, poor Moses. They complained about Moses a lot. But this is the first time that they had spoke out specifically against God. The words here and the language that we use are not strong enough. It doesn't give a full force of what they're saying. They are actively and openly rebelling against God when they grumble and complain. The, the people claim that the bread of heaven was worthless, and in doing so, they were actually showing contempt to God, who is the giver of all good gifts. In addition... They have a, another familiar complaint that they express all the time. This is the idea that things were a lot better back in Egypt. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Now when you think about it, and if you know much about Egypt and their 400 years in Egypt, they were not remembering that experience correctly. And truthfully, think about this. Many of them had never grown up in Egypt. They were too young. So they're just hearing the complaints of those who were old enough to know any stories of Egypt. They seriously are deluding themselves to think that there's any way back to where they were. That makes me think about the fact that fantasies of the good old days did not help them live in the present. And neither does it help us, does it? I have to pause for a minute here because 
this story is so much about God. It's all about him and his saving ways, what he does for his people, his plan of salvation. But we can't miss an opportunity to look closely at what's right in front of us in this passage. Do we see how our culture mirrors that of the Israelites? <laughs> Ours is a complaining, grumbling, and whining culture. Yes. It has become toxic, and it is hard to escape, is it not? We turn on the TV, we look on our computers, we read articles, we listen to the radio. What do we hear? We're in the grocery store, we're waiting in line. It's pervasive. This is where I need you to think with me about this because we could miss this if we're not looking closely. The children of Israel had been guilty of all sorts of sin over the years. But what is the sin here? It, it's not sexual sin. It's not stealing. It's not robbing. It's not physically harming other people. It's not even committing murder. Their sin is complaining. Let's take that in for a minute. What are they complaining about? God and his goodness and his provisions for them. That's what they're complaining about. Their ingratitude then brings these people to a place of judgment. I have to tell you, this is so sobering to me. Even in my own study of this passage, I have to confess, I honestly find it convicting to my own heart. Us here, brothers and sisters, most of us here, all of us here, know the Lord. We know the grace and mercy of God and His goodness to us. So, there's a question I have to ask because I've had to ask myself this over the weeks as I've prepared for this. Are we, am I, so immersed in this culture that we become a part of the problem? And that we stand in need of confession and repentance? That oftentimes we don't see and express the goodness and the provision, our thankfulness for the goodness and provision of God in our everyday lives? Or we spend so much time focused on what is wrong with this world that we're in danger of fostering in our own hearts a complaining, ungrateful spirit towards God. God help us. For I fear that if people who are not of faith cannot see us who are of faith, continually speak of the goodness of God in the midst of the difficulties of our lives. What will point them to a God that saves? Yeah. Mm. Let's take a moment. Let's just bow our heads. Father, there's something about this whole message and we look at the era of the children of God, your children, that you are leading and guiding them, not being able to recognize your goodness. And right now, Father, as your children, as your chosen people, as those that love you, search our hearts, Lord, and see if there be any wicked way within us. Father, help us that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts always be acceptable to you, O oh Lord. And if there is need for confession in our hearts for complaining and murmuring and grumbling, that we
we recognize it and just surrender it to you for forgiveness. Amen. Now, we see that the rebellious and ungrateful people, God's children, their sin brings consequences. God is not pleased. Ronald Allen wrote, Throughout the story, God is one calling them into a faithful life of obedience. God is indeed forming a faithful nation, which he is with us. I mean, he is continually calling his people into faithfulness and obedience. But he says here, when they rebel, consequences follow. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents and snakes among the people, and they bit them, and so many of the Israelites died. Nasty snakes. Nasty, poisonous snakes that inflict extreme pain and suffering, and death is inevitable. You know, there's a lot of controversy and questions about whether or not the snakes were in the desert and this was just a natural occurrence, but there were just seemed to be a whole lot of them or that God brought these particular kinds of snakes. I don't know the answer to all that. But all I know is that they were everywhere and people were dying. So the Israelites repented. They repented of their complaining and their ingratitude and they went to Moses and they said, Moses, you pray to the Lord, make intercession for us, which was his prophetic role for them. And as a result, God in his mercy forgives. He forgives his people. God in his mercy. Can I say that again? God in his mercy forgives. And he instructs Moses in the way of healing. Now, this is where it just gets so weird. He said to make a poisonous snake, make one out of bronze, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. That's weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's just say it. It's weird. God does judge our sinful ways. And sometimes the consequences and the penalties are tiny and small. Sometimes they lead to death. <laughs> My good friend, she is raising two small children, her and her husband. And they have this little liturgy with them that they started. They're eight and nine years old or seven and eight, something like that. They had this liturgy they started from the time that they were little. And it was make good choices. Why? Bad choices have consequences. I mean, you can ask either one of those two, make bad, make good choices, and they would say to you, because bad choices have consequences. That's not so bad for parents today to teach that. They do have consequences, and they can be small. I was reading, this is very interesting. I found this. I can't believe I found this. There was... Um, a study done, now this study was done 15 years ago, so I'm sure there's been studies done since then, but this is fascinating to me. Do you know that the stress that comes from complaining actually shrinks your brain? I know all of us are going, oh! um, <laughs> let's get to the altar and pray now because we're <laughs> losing our brain power. Um, it, this is fascinating to me. The, the hippocampus part of your brain is the part of the brain that's involved in the formation of new memories and is also associated with learning and with emotions. And what they found is that people who spend a great deal of their time complaining or, listen to this, complaining or even being complained to for 30 minutes or more can be physically damaging to your brain. That's an interesting little consequence of complaining, <laughs> of sinful behavior of complaining, is it not? This is even worse, and this was 15 <clears throat> years ago. So the worst part is the average person complains between 15 to 30 times a day. I'm sure now that might be 50 to 100 times a day. Consequences for sin. Sometimes we don't want to talk about that because 
we live this side of grace, you know, and so uh, the, uh, this side of the Calvary, and we, we, we just hang on to grace, which we know God is graceful, gracious. I can't talk this morning. I'm sorry. That's a bad habit. That's a bad problem for the preacher, isn't it, Pastor? <laughs> Pat, the preacher can't talk straight. Uh, but sin has consequences. Yet God in his mercy and love for Israel and for us, is first and foremost, God himself provides the means for their forgiveness and healing, and he does for us. Now, we have to keep in mind, the Israelites had to respond. I mean, the snakes were everywhere. They were in their houses, in the, in the yards, in the gardens. They were absolutely everywhere. So when you got bit, you had to go to wherever the snake was that you could see the snake on the pole to be healed. And all you had to do was look and live. It was not the snake that was doing the healing. And it was not anything that was on the part of the people except for their obedience and their action of going and trusting that God had made a way. He had made a way of healing. It is a strange story. I mean, you think about the fact that fiery, deadly snakes are killing people as judgment. And then the redemptive part of this is looking to a bronze replica of the stakes. And that's the redemptive part. A theologian, an Old Testament theologian, Elizabeth Actemar wrote, This text is an account primarily of God's actions towards his chosen people. The account of both his judgment and his forgiving mercy. From that standpoint... It is a text that we need to ponder because we in the church are also God's chosen folks making our way towards the promised land of the kingdom of God, sometimes wearily through dryness and dangers of our lives. Our text tells us that we journey through the ups and downs of every day, that God deals with us both in judgment and mercy, but always, 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 there is healing and life for us from the hand of God. Yes, the healing comes when we repent and accept directions from God. And life comes only through the means that God of life has given us. Praise be to our God. He has given us the means of healing and life, hasn't he? He's given it through the life that Jesus Christ recalls, what he talks about in this ancient story with his conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus tells Nicodemus that the Son of God, Jesus himself, must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness for the Israelites. Nicodemus would have understood that. He would have understood that the healing came from the hand of God. He knew that story. And he knew that it wasn't the serpent that saved them. It was God that saved them through his redeeming ways. And so the Son of God would be lifted up. Christ would be lifted up on the cross. And whoever trusts in him and his saving sacrifice will have eternal life. No more longing for a life of slavery that we knew before. Now, it's been a long time since I came to Christ. But you know what? I can remember that slavery. I don't want to go back to that slavery before I knew Christ. No more belief that anything can separate us from the love of God. No more eternal death. No more frutality, fr fertility, 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 and fear. Fear concerning life's hardships and the craziness that's going on in our world and the things that confront us and the difficulties and the struggles and the things that we don't understand. No more concern over those things. Just trust. Did you notice something about the story, though? It's really interesting. Did you notice what the people ask God for? What did they ask God for when they prayed to, talked to Moses and repented of their sins? That the snakes would be taken away. Yes. 
Were the snakes taken away? No. They didn't get what they asked for. Well, not really. They did get what they asked for, but they were asking that God would fix it. Wanted a quick fix. It wasn't a quick fix. God's answer was not a, a, an answer to their snake problem. Snakes were still everywhere. Snakes were still biting people. But what God did was he made a way. He made a way. Jesus is the way. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't come to take away our poisonous stakes, but he did come to save us and redeem us. Yes. He wanted his people to trust him, and looking at the bronze snake demonstrated that. And we look to Christ, high and lifted up. We look to him in faith, and in God's power to change us and make us new and redeem us. And for that reason, when we come to him, we find healing for our souls. We find redemption. We find peace. And we find eternal life forevermore. Let us pray. Father, you know your servants stumbled and stammered this morning. And I'm not sure why. Sometimes I just think it's the old enemy that we deceives us and speaks against us and tries to stop us. And yet, Lord, your spirit has been here among us, and I'm so thankful and so grateful. This is a strange story. And I'm not afraid to tell people I serve a God that does things in strange ways because I know the result of that is that I'm made new. So I pray for any here today. This is family here today, Lord. We're, most of us have known you for a long, long time. But God, if there's someone here today that there's a struggle, you're just not sure, you just feel like you don't know whether you're redeemed or not, Father, today, Help them to look to the cross, to Jesus. And just simply say where they sit right now, God, I need you to heal me of my sin and to make me new. I know, God, you'll do that. And then, Lord, send us out today. Help us to be aware through the Holy Spirit when we complain and grumble. Just whisper to us. Or if you have to hit us over the head with a two by four to help us realize that we need to be people that speak our gratitude and thanksgiving for you moment by moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. You want me to dismiss us, or would you like to? <laughs> Thank you for coming this weekend. Thank you for making this part of your weekend. God bless yes. you. Remember the message. No complaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's the memo. <laughs> I don't want snake bit. You don't either. <laughs> God bless you, Karen. I appreciate that. I needed that. You watch enough news, you'll all be complaining, just like me. <laughs> Let's stand. God has the cure, doesn't he? Yes, he does. God has the cure. We're all snake bit. It's called sin. <coughs> Jesus is the answer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your servant who has shared with us a message we needed. Lord, may we go out and live it. And may we truly be the light of the world. That, that shines forth the joy of the Lord from our hearts 
to a world that's desperately needing to hear it. God, may we go forth with your praise and thanksgiving in our heart. And Father, uh, uh, keep you number one in all things. Keep us safe on the road. Give us an enjoyable day. May we truly rest, for it is a day of rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.